Uh, well, uh, thank you, uh, Akis, and many thanks to Jane for the invitation to present here today. I've long admired, engaged, and taught uh, her scholarship, and so it's been an utter privilege to have her here this year as a colleague. And I was delighted by the invitation to engage the, the themes that she presented uh, at, in the call for papers uh, for this conference. Uh, and I should say, uh, uh, following up on that, thanks to the other presenters. I feel like I've learned a tremendous amount over the past day and a half and listening to you all. If I had had the time to actually rewrite my paper this morning, I would have. Uh, but the ship had, was already out of the harbor, so please sail along with me. Um, so in this presentation, I explore the life and afterlife of a 2004 postcard writing campaign that was undertaken in the Republic of Macedonia in order to examine the material paraphernalia of mass petitions and the conditions of their political potency. As Francis Cody has argued, petitions have a performative quality. When localized felicity conditions are met, petitions create the very collective subject that they claim to represent. Mass petitions and their complementary paraphernalia, t-shirts, posters, stickers, slogans, websites, images, thus mediate and materialize a particular form of effective politics. One that registers both in the thrill of issuing calls for redress but also in the not so infrequent disappointment of underwhelming response or unexpected turn. But what happens to such effective paraphernalia in the wake of petition actions? And what happens when they are reanimated in shifting contexts and towards shifting ends? This presentation takes up these questions by examining a 2004 Macedonian postcard writing campaign and the 2018 recycling of the campaign's primary slogan and imagery. Organized under the slogan, Don't You Fire On Me, Say Macedonia, the 2004 campaign petitioned leadership at the Council of Europe to revise their conventions for referring to Macedonia, a topic that had been highly politicized due to the long-standing dispute between Macedonia and Greece over the former's name. Remarkably, the visual paraphernalia of the 2004 postcard campaign reappeared in adapted fashion 14 years later during the 2018 protests opposing the PRESPA agreement by which Macedonia would change its name to North Macedonia in exchange for an end to the Greek obstruction of the country's NATO and EU accession. T-shirts and posters proclaimed, don't you North me, say Macedonia. Uh, if their target addressees, their political aims, and even their political potencies differed from the postcard campaign in significant ways. So you can see here the original campaigns prepared for the 2004 uh, initiative. Uh, people signing, uh, writing uh, their postcards to the Council of Europe. And then last summer when I was in Macedonia doing, Macedonia doing research, you saw the appropriation uh, of this imagery in posters, on t-shirts, uh, and on pa uh, uh, pamphlets uh, that were taped uh, across, uh, across the city of Skopje, where I was located. So although this will be in a somewhat idiosyncratic and speculative mode, my aim in this presentation is to construct an ethnography of this echo, of a slogan and image divorced from the material form and communicative structure of a mass petition, and to reflect on the thick history and multiple mediations of effective politics. At the risk of overstatement, I would contend that much recent work in anthropology on so-called political technologies tends to focus on particular examples in particular cases. So an article uh, or a book on volunteerism will treat it as a discrete case. An article on elections will treat them as a discrete case and so on. In this paper, I instead want to examine and compare two moments and two political forms that are linked both by popular historical memory and by the broader history of cultural politics in Macedonia, now North Macedonia. From this grounded historical perspective, I work to trouble a hegemonic narrative on contemporary political polarization of left versus right, of liberalism versus populism, to a more nuanced understanding of the political technologies that mediate performances of popular sovereignty. The structure of the presentation will be as follows. There is a structure you'll be happy to know. Uh, I begin by sketching out some general thoughts on mass petitions as a performative and political technology. Uh, I then turn to analyze the 2004 uh, postcard campaign launched in Macedonia against perceived misjustice at the Council of Europe. Uh, I then leap forward in time uh, to the summer of 2018 when the postcard graphic was reappropriated within a strategy of political boycott uh, against the referendum on the Presva Agreement 
With the postcard graphic then as a common anchor between these moments, I conclude by reflecting on the similarity and the differences of mass petition and political boycott as technologies of popular sovereignty. So part one, the mass petition as a political technology. Popular sovereignty is one of the great generative myths of modernity. From the enlightenment onward in both political philosophy and political practice, numerous registers, technologies, and institutions have emerged through which the figure of the people as sovereign is invoked and inhabited. Elections, insurgencies, revolutions, referenda, polling, demonstrations, coups, marches, meetings, strikes, registers of plain speaking, and even to reference Lauren Berlant, the figure of the infantile subject. We can understand each of these as different ways in which the figure of people as sovereign is invoked and inhabited. And indeed, from at least Rousseau onward, scholars have reckoned with the performativity of the social contract and the irreducibility of the general will to the people as aggregate. The people so often seems to exceed any given articulation. And hence, looking historically, one can find, a myri can find myriad rival claims to and forms of popular sovereignty. As William Mazzarella has argued, liberalism's long 20th century was itself predicated on technologies of public affect that functioned, if not always with success, to excite and harness the energy of mass democracy and uh, uh, mass publicity. Within this context, uh, I situate the mass petition as a particular technology of popular sovereignty, of performing the people, and seeking to harness this performance towards instrumental political ends. By mass petitions, I'm referring to those occasional, typically self-organized movements that center on a complaint, demand, or appeal that is composed into a text artifact that is then circulated publicly and to which supporters are called to endorse through public signature. I'm supposing that we have all signed mass petitions, uh, especially now with the existence of e-petitions. In recent memory, I recall sending my name to mass petitions uh, that protested the erasure of anthropology by the Polish Academy of Sciences, that supported anti-government protesters in Serbia, and that called for the restoration of Spanish language websites to the whitehouse.gov uh, webpage after the Trump administration abruptly removed them in January uh, 2017. The list could go on. Uh, as a technology of popular sovereignty, mass petitions uh, remain very common in the present day, as uh, Dimitro uh, amply demonstrated in his presentation. Let me note, though, that they differ from the official solicited petitions that many, of you, uh, many uh, others have discussed uh, today uh, and yesterday uh, during this conference. Uh, and, uh, and I'm thinking here especially of Jane's groundbreaking work on the League of Nations uh, minorities uh, section. Uh, as well as Keith's really stellar work on the pension uh, program of the Ilinden veterans um, that were organized during the er early years of Yugoslav Macedonia, uh, the, the, the pension scheme. In these cases, uh, participants responded to an established bureaucratic procedure for making requests, and the validity of the petitioning process derived from uh, the bureaucracies that solicited, received, and evaluated individual petitions. And for instance, such official petitions, if we were to think of them in, in that sense, can be accepted or rejected on the basis of formal criteria, which again, Jane's work on the League of Nations and the interdiction uh, of violent language uh, uh, makes amply clear. In contrast, the mass petitions that I'm talking about are self-organized movements that cannot be refused according to such a bureaucratic logic. Although, of course, they can be rejected or ignored, uh, or as we heard yesterday, their signers uh, can be persecuted. Um, thus, uh, although mass petitions share several formal properties with official petitions, uh, for instance, the written complaint and often a collection of signatures, I would argue that the two are different species. In particular, their legitimacy and efficacy are not tethered to the processes of bureaucratic procedure and evaluation. Rather, mass petitions achieve legitimacy and efficacy through their publicity, which is crucial to how they construct a mass petitioning subject and to how petitioning, and here I'm quoting uh, uh, Jane's vision statement for the conference, aims to constitute a social relation between petitioner and addressee and to instigate a response. On this matter, uh, what I would generally describe as the publicity and performativity of mass petitions, there are four dimensions that I would like to highlight. 
So petitions as a political technology, four dimensions I would like to highlight. First, to state the obvious and uh, uh, an issue that many of, uh, uh, of uh, my colleagues and peers here today have already addressed. Petitions, mass petitions, are a type of speech act in the classic sense of the term, the Aust uh, Aust Austinian sense of the term. The event of their utterance accomplishes a so socially significant action. In basic terms, mass petitions have an illocutionary effect. They do things like issue a request or level a demand or proclaim support. Second, in doing so, mass petitions also presuppose and construct a mass subject, some formulation of the people, the constituency, or the community that is engaged in the act of petitioning. That is, petitions do not merely represent the desires of some pre-established community, but rather, in articulating some desire or claim, petitioners constitute some mass subject of appeal and assert their authority to represent this community. In this, they partake in a longer historical tradition of performing the people uh, and of claiming popular sovereignty through the mediation of te text, as Benjamin Lee has so eloquently analyzed. It is worth highlighting, however, the historical and ideological significance of this text mediation of a people constituted around a written and signed statement. In contrast to crowds uh, or demonstrations that claim to instantiate the people in an embodied form, petitions constitute their subjects within an aesthetic of bureaucratic reason and democratic ideology. So it's not responding to bureaucratic procedure per se, but it mobilizes the aesthetics of bureaucratic procedure. Right? You're enumerating uh, uh, supporters of some statement that's been uh, articulated in one standardized, uh, presumably consensus uh, guise, or a guise that at least uh, might be, uh, that makes a claim to consensus. Third, in issuing an appeal, petitions also construct their addressees in particular ways. Most obviously, mass petitions often name a target addressee or addressees uh, to whom the, petition, whom the petitions aim to interpolate as responsible agents. And again, echoing Jane to move, uh, to move them to action. On another level, however, the social efficacy of mass petitions derives from their secondary address to a mass public, one that is called to witness and to endorse through signature the appeals and the complaints that the petition voices. In practice, then, if mass petitions are often formulated through discourses on justice, uh, in evoking uh, a larger mass public, mass petitions operate through a logic of shaming. This leads to my fourth observation. Mass petitions constitute an interesting form of mass publicity. In his classic essay, Publics and Counterpublics, Michael Warner theorizes publics as a social form that is constituted through discourse alone, that is, publics exist by virtue of being addressed, and in turn, public address can be characterized by its appeal to an open-ended, indefinite audience. Mass petitions also depend on an address to an open-ended audience, right? Petitions never have a limit on the signatures they collect. You just add another number and add your signature and the list could expand infinitely, at least in theory, if uh, obviously never in practice. Uh, and crucially, it is the publicness of mass petitions, both in terms of the subject that they constitute and the social pressure that they seek to mount, that can serve to legitimize any particular act of petition. In issuing a request or demand, petitions make an effective appeal to a mass public and via the signature, provide a mechanism to harness and instrumentalize the individual's uptake of the effective message. From a historical perspective then, petitions constitute an important political technology of publicity and the technology only operates under the right conditions. They are mechanisms to animate publics and to harness them in pursuit of political change or redress. So let's move on to some actual uh, ethnographic cases. So uh, the first case, the 2004 Don't You Fire On Me campaign. Uh, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, one can see these aspects of mass petitions well on display in the case of the 2004 post writing campaign. That was undertaken uh, in the then named Republic of Macedonia. On a general level, the Don't You Fire On Me Say Macedonia campaign responded to a long standing dispute that existed between Greece and Macedonia over the name Macedonia. Specifically, however, the campaign was provoked by revelations that the General Secretariat of the Council of Europe, which we just heard about, an interstate body that fosters European coordination and cooperation on matters related to human rights and the rule of law, 
had adopted to refer to Mas adopted conventions to refer to Macedonia, the Macedonian language, and the Macedonian ethnicity that exceeded the already in Macedonia unpopular temporary name, the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, often abbreviated as FIROM, that was forced on the country for use in the United Nations. Through the, uh, through the action, thousands of yellow postcards printed with the slogan, don't you fire on me, say Macedonia, were sent to the Council of Europe offices in Strasbourg. The campaign was thus a variant of the classic mass petition of request or demand endorsed by numerous signatures. In the Macedonian case, the front of the postcards quite visibly and succinctly stated the demand, say Macedonia, not fire on. Uh, and on the back, individuals could personalize their statement and of course, sign their names. The flood of postcards that arrived in Strasbourg was thus a spectacular manifestation of the mass petition. And ultimately, the campaign resulted in the reformulation of the Council of Europe's conventions for reference to Macedonia. So how did this mass, this mass petition come about and what can we learn from it? The first point that I would like to emphasize is that this particular mass petition movement emerged through and in relation to a broader mass media public sphere. Indeed, the movement began with a news report that offered a revelation. On March 15, 2004, journalist Zoran Andonovsky broke a story in the now defunct Macedonian language news daily Vreme about a Council of Europe document that outlined terms of address for Macedonia and its residents for use in communications with the office of the general secretary. According to Andonovsky's article, the document dated March 2nd, 2004, described that the dominant language and culture of Macedonia should be referred to as Slav Macedonian, that the citizens of the country should not be called Macedonians, but rather citizens of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, and finally, that members of the Macedonian diaspora should, not, should be referred to as Macedonians who identify themselves as Slav Macedonians. These guidelines were in addition to, but went well beyond the use of the former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia or FIROM. Interestingly, as the news story developed over the, the subsequent days, it took on dimensions that would later impact the postcard campaign. And so the very next day on March 16th, Vreme led with a Council of Europe story on his front page, but in this case, the story had widened while again underscoring the perceived injustice of the new uh, Council of Europe naming conventions the report also focused on the activity, or rather the inactivity, of Macedonia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs, asking how did Macedonian diplomats let this transgression happen? Such reportage was echoed across other Macedonian language news dailies. Furthermore, March 16th also saw two articles of published commentary on the emerging Council of Europe scandal. In an editorial in Vreme, Zoran Andonovsky, uh, uh, and also in an op-ed piece published in the newspaper uh, Nevnik by uh, Lubomir Fruchkovsky, a politician and one of Macedonia's leading public intellectuals. Each author highlighted the hypocrisy of the Council of Europe, an organization ostensibly with a mission to increase harmony and unity between its member states, for unilaterally taking sides on the Greek-Macedonian naming dispute, and in effect subordinating all of its constituent members to the will of one, that is Greece, uh, both of these published uh, commentaries, however, concluded with a call for public response uh, to the document uh, at the Council of Europe. And Danovsky called for citizens, here I'm translating and quoting, citizens to remind foreigners what Macedonia's name is. And Fershkovsky asked readers to prove that Macedonia will not acquiesce. Let us note here, only two days after the news story on the Council of Europe first appeared, we can detect the participant roles of mass petition taking shape. A perceived injustice has been identified, along with a responsible party, uh, the Council of Europe General Secretary, Volter Schwimer. Furthermore, the op-ed commentary specify an aggrieved party, Macedonians, who are called to action, especially given doubts on the foreign ministry's ability to respond appropriately to the scandal. It was, in, it was within this context that a consortium of NGOs led by the Macedonian Center for International Cooperation uh, banded together to spearhead a mass uh, postcard protest of the Council of Europe. Under the motto, Say Macedonia, the NGOs designated and printed the Don't Fire On Me postcards, which were then included as inserts in several Macedonian news dailies. In addition, oh, I'm going to have to really... Sorry, I mean, I really oh. hate what I'm doing at the moment. Because you are... Yeah, yeah. Pardon? Yeah, we have, it, everybody has half an hour, so yeah. yeah. But I, yeah. didn't I start at... Uh, 
Yeah, definitely in the next half hour. I mean, I would no. not really give you my... Didn't I start a quarter past? Oh, well, anyway. Uh, 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 so, uh... Another, another 10 minutes. Huh? Um, oh, okay. Um, well, I will continue, and I will try to be brief. Um, so, uh, postcard m movement, uh, booth set up uh, in, in the central square of Macedonia, people standing in line to fill out the postcards. Um, uh, and indeed, uh, as the postcards began to, to arrive in Strasbourg, uh, in a letter to the foreign uh, minister, uh, Schwimmer affirmed that the only official document on how to address Macedonia was the pre-existing uh, 1995 UN resolution. He thereby uh, invalidated the controversial document. Uh, importantly, alongside these developments, continuing media coverage of the pet petition presented an affirming meta-discourse on the postcard campaign. Uh, 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 celebrating the resounding protest of the media, citizens, and citizen movements uh, that had forced Schwimmer uh, and the General Secretariat to disavow the document. Um, beyond the rhetoric of the postcard campaign uh, and the uh, accompanying news coverage, there was an emerging a sense of popular action that had a palpable effect on daily life in Skopje. I was there at the, the time conducting dissertation fieldwork. Um, and uh, all of a sudden, there were t-shirts, baseball caps, uh, showing the Don't You Fire Me logo, uh, and this uh, uh, sense of enlivenment uh, as people participated in this collective stand against Europe's hypocrisy uh, against Macedonia. Uh, so importantly, across these few days, we see the logic of mass petitioning on display in a particularly robust fashion. The petitioning movement is self-organized and consolidated through its public uptake. The, uh, uh, in positing a transgression and a target addressee, the mass petition performatively invokes an aggrieved subject. This subject and its agency are constituted through the public circulation of petition. Both the circulation of the petition and also the circulation of news stories on it and of paraphernalia that indexes it. And importantly, the act of positioning, petitioning constructs the mass subject of the petition in a particular way. Something approaching a, a liberal subject figured in terms of emotions and rights, but mobilized within a form that is consonant with bureaucratic rationality and democratic ideology. Uh, ultimately, there was uh, 210,000 postcards that were sent to, to Strasbourg. Uh, um, and I think we can see how the same Macedonia campaign, in some sense, represents what might be an ideal typical model of the ideal successful mass petition. Um, uh, in, in that it, it uh, not only was it effective in constituting a recognized mass subject, but actually achieved the, the stated ends that, that it, it hoped to bring about. So let's move to 2018, fast forward 14 years. In June of last year, uh, the Macedonian and Greek government signed uh, the, uh, the PRESPA agreement, which was negotiated to end the country's longstanding dispute over the name Macedonia. Uh, the agreement, which was implemented earlier this year in February, called for Macedonia to change its name to North Macedonia, which the country is now referred to, the Republic of North Macedonia. Uh, however, when the agreement was announced, predictably, uh, it was polarizing within Macedonia. Many, many people supported the agreement as a pragmatic move to spur on political change and European integration in Macedonia, and also as a rejection of nas the nationalist politics of former uh, Prime Minister Nikola Gruevski. However, many, many people were also upset by the agreement, seeing it as an assault on Macedonian national identity. The Macedonian government, led by Prime Minister Zoran Zaev, promised to submit the agreement to a consultative popular referendum, which was scheduled for September 30th, 2018. Importantly, uh, Christian Mitskowski, uh, who replaced Gruevski as the leader of the, the nationalist right party, the Vamaro de Pomona'e, equivocated on his party strategy for the referendum. But several uh, of his MPs joined with independent nationalist organizations to call for a boycott of the referendum vote. By Macedonian law, referendums must, 50% uh, uh, of uh, registered voters must participate in a referendum for it to be valid. The fact that Macedonian voter rolls were out of date and bloated, containing the names of many people who were dead or had moved out of the country, made the 50% threshold even steeper in practice. And so the boycott strategy rested on the admission that the referendum could not be won by opponents of the PRESPA agreement in a straightforward vote. Right? We couldn't actually beat it by going out to vote. 
but that it might be invalidated by a uh, legal technicality if a sufficient number of registered voters boycotted uh, the referendum vote itself. Over the summer of 2018, the boycott movement began to take shape under the hashtag banner, hashtag boycott uh, or I boycott. Um, by my own reckoning, boycott tiram uh, first appeared through social media, then in graffiti, uh, boycott the referendum, again, boycott the referendum, uh, uh, then through posters uh, and t-shirts, uh, hashtag boycott tiram, I boycott. A pro protester camp was set up in the park across the street from the Macedonian Parliament building. And on September 8th, Macedon Macedonian Independence Day, the hashtag Boycott Tierra movement hosted a political demonstration. Uh, here's a photograph of it uh, in, uh, in, front, in the street in front of the Macedonian Parliament building. Interestingly, though, among the sundry media produced to protest the agreement, hashtags, posters, uh, graffitos, stickers, t-shirts, the slogan, don't you north me, say Macedonia, frequently appeared always on a yellow backdrop. Again, this image. And what can I say? This appropriation of the don't you firearm uh, me graphic, a uh, one which had been so ubiquitous 14 years ago, struck me. On the one hand, its transformed reappearance shouldn't be so surprising. It's drawing a parallel. If the 2004 protest was one that was morally sound, so too should this be a morally sound protest against a perceived uh, injustice against Macedonia. On the other hand, though, the formal and historical context of the Don't You North Me moment, 2018, was so tremendously different from 2004. And I want to learn from this distance, difference. So let us recall the performative structure of a mass petition. In identifying an issue and a target, the petition functions to construct a particular petitioning subject. The subject is then performed and possibly ratified, and it develops agency through the very publicity of the petition and its formal style, which channels bureaucratic rationality and works to enumerate the people. However, uh, this is always contingent. Uh, not all issues can be articulated through the petition. Not all targets can be addressed through a petition. Not all mass subjects can be framed as a petitioning subject. And not all petitions achieve uptake among individuals, the news media, and supporting organizations in the way that the 2004 campaign did. The mass petition is thus a quite specific technology for performing the people. And indeed, we encountered these limitations in the 2018 case of boycottiram. Uh, I hope that it's obvious that this campaign too sought to perform the people, that is, it was calling upon some notion of popular sovereignty to challenge the Prespa agreement. But unlike the enumerated subject of a petition, uh, or of a referendum vote for that matter, Boycott Tiram did so in a ghostly way. Its strategy was one of absence rather than presence. The mass subject of Boycott Tiram was one that would refuse enumeration and refuse bureaucratic rationality. Hence the hashtag, hence the, the graffiti, right? Who's, who's the author? It's a, a, nameless, uh, a nameless author, a ghostly appearing on buildings uh, overnight. Hence social media and anonymous online trolling. So the boycott was as clearly a different uh, sort of political te technology, albeit also a public one. It vacated procedure and circumvented mainstream media. It privileged ghostliness and hyperbole over massification uh, and reasoned demand. And one place that this is evident, and I'm really well, almost finishing this, this one example, and then I'll lead to my concluding remarks, was in the political rallies uh, led to support uh, the Boycott Tierra movement, which tended to at once be quite solemn affairs celebrating the sacredness of the Macedonian nation, but also very vulgar and excessive. And so in one case, the September 18th uh, rally uh, for Boycott Tierra against, uh, uh, against the referendum uh, it began with a, a Macedonian flag, the old Macedonian flag, uh, being unfurled in front of the new statue to Alexander the Great in shock and reverence, as if to sanctify the flag and to sanctify the holy statue of Alexander the Great. Uh, later on, uh, however, at that's the same rally, the flag was taken in front of the, the stage of the rally, uh, there was this rapper duo, uh, Puka Cosmetica, uh, who uh, started rapping about how Angela Merkel should uh, give them fellatio and how they were going to pr uh, perform anal sex on all politicians, albeit in less polite ways than I've just described. And so there was this odd combination of the sacred and the vulgar at the same moment. Um, and I think it's here um, that the quality of the rally and the forms of expressions enabled uh, by the technology of boycott can help us understand the reappearance of the same Macedonia postcard graphic. 
As a residue of the 2014 campaign, it argued that the current protests spanned a longer history and it recalled the mass action of years ago. But in the context of hashtag boycott tiram, to say Macedonia's slogan could only be a, one among many messages, the very structure of the, of the boycott as a political technology impeded a consensus statement of clear and pragmatic demand. Instead, slogans proliferated and the conventional cohabitated with the extreme. And so Don't You North Me uh, appeared alongside those other slogans and performances that verged towards the sacred or vulgar hyperbole. The postcard image was detached from the 2004 mass petition, and when recontextualized in the moment of boycott tiram, it too had a ghostly character of a past calling to the present, but whose mass subject could no longer be defined, embodied, or enumerated. So to conclude, uh, uh, one paragraph. Zooming outward from these two cases of the mass petition and the mass boycott, we can appreciate the commonalities and the differences between these uh, two public technologies of public sovereignty. Both claim to express popular will, and both presuppose and depend on the logics of mass publicity, both for their uptake and also for their effective charge, or the effective charge that they seek to spark and to harness. But we can also appreciate what makes these technologies different. Their very logics, their very structure, constructs its mass subject, its popular sovereign, in formally and aesthetically distinct fashions as they work to interpolate their uh, target addressees and their audiences of witnesses and participants. Whereas the mass uh, petition operates through rational statement, quasi-bureaucratic formalism and enumeration, the boycott produces a ghostly presence that eschews embodiment but provokes hyperbole. And indeed, one might be tempted to map these distinctions onto a present-day dichotomy between liberal rationality and the excessiveness of neopopulism, the former submitting to procedure while the latter delights in excess. If there is one thing, however, that I think we can learn from the political history of, say, Macedonia, the graphic, the image, is that these modalities are not as diametrically opposed as some might assume. Rather, they participate in the common myth of popular sovereignty, both responding to and constructing a political horizon in which the people act, of performing the people to a political structure that depends on but never completely monopolizes popular benediction. Thank you. <laughs>